Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Today we are pleased to have Professor Rina Barber from University of Chicago to join our webinar. Um, Rina is uh, Rina is an expert in a lot of areas, including developing and analyzing estimation, inference, and optimization tools for structured high dimensional data problems such as sparse regression, sparse non parametric models, and low rank models. Um, she works on developing methods for false discovery rate control in settings where under sampled data or misspecific misspecified models may be pre present and for distribution free inference in settings where the data distribution is unknown. She also collaborates on modeling and optimization problems in image reconstruction for medical imaging. And today she's going to tell us about stability of black box algorithms. So let's welcome Rina. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for the invitation. It's um, really great to get to be part of this wonderful webinar series. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, I want to welcome everyone to jump in with questions anytime. I'm really happy to um, you know, give more detail on anything that anyone's interested in or discuss other aspects of this work. A lot of this is really new work, so we're still only just starting to figure out the implications. So your feedback is super welcome and don't hesitate to jump in with questions. Um, so I'm actually going to be talking about two separate projects that are kind of complementary to each other. They're both about algorithmic stability, and I'll introduce what that idea means in a second. But the two results are very different. One of them is a hardness result that tells us why the problem has a lot of um, at least theoretical challenges um, that make it hard to develop methods that are going to reliably give guarantees in this setting. The second result is from the other end, it's a positive result that tells us that when we use bagging or ensembling, we might be more familiar with terms like bootstrapping, when we use methods like that in conjunction with any learning algorithm, stability comes for free. So these are two separate works. Um, for both of these, I've been really lucky to get to work with wonderful collaborators. The first result, the hardness result, was driven by my former PhD student, Buell Kim. She's now at University of Washington. The more recent result, the positive result about bagging, is joint work with Jake Soloff, who's a postdoc currently at UChicago, working with me and with my colleague, Rebecca Willett, who um, is also a collaborator on this project. So the second project has been led by Jake. Um, and it's very much thanks to these wonderful collaborators that we were able to um, get these fun results. Okay, so let me dive in. Um, I'm going to spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about background on algorithmic stability and why, what it is, why we care, um, and then I'll talk about the two individual results. So before I get started, I see that there's a hand raised. Um, does someone have a question? Let me see if I can unmute. Oh, the hand is down. Okay, never mind. All right, so yeah, feel free to jump in anytime if you have questions. Okay, so um, algorithmic stability is an idea that has a lot of interest both theoretically and in practice. I'm going to introduce it from the more theoretical point of view because that's my field, but this is something that we can study in a more intuitive way as well and see how things play out empirically. I will show some empirical results later on. So to formalize things a little bit, what we're asking about, we're thinking about algorithms as any procedure that inputs a labeled training data set, so that's my x, y pairs, so think of this as a regression problem or a classification problem, and we're going to output a fitted model. So a fitted model meaning something where I can give it an x and it will predict a y. Now, what might we want these procedures to do? So of course, we don't want them to output something that's just pure noise. We want them to learn meaningful models that tell us something about how this data behaves, and that, for example, do a good job uncovering trends in the data, do a good job predicting why for future data. So what might we hope for? So on this slide, I've listed kind of a hierarchy of like different you know, goals we might have. And I've ordered them in terms of like the most ambitious goals that require the most assumptions in order for them to be possible, moving our way down to ones that are more robust and perhaps possible to achieve with fewer assumptions. So if we're in an assumption heavy setting, for example, I'm running linear regression, I'm in you know, my intro to regression class and I assume the linear model is true and I run linear regression and believe that that model holds, then what we learn in, in, um, in the sort of theory of regression is that there is like certain distribution such that my you know, beta hat recovers the true beta up to some amount of noise. So in that type of setting, the fitted model F hat, which in that specific example might be something like the fitted linear model, is accurately estimating the true conditional model of Y given X when I'm assuming that the model family that I'm working within is actually true for this data that I'm gathering. 
Now, of course, that's an extremely restrictive assumption. We know that linear models might be a good approximation to real data, but are never going to be exactly true. So maybe we might relax our assumptions and say like, well, the model is a good approximation and we would quantify that in some way. And so then perhaps we can't say that F hat is recovering the true model because maybe there is no true model. We don't believe linear regression holds exactly, but perhaps it holds close enough so that we can say our fitted model is guaranteed to be predicting the response Y quite accurately. So that still requires some fairly heavy assumptions. If we want to continue to remove assumptions and say like, well, maybe I'm working in a model class like linear models that may or may not provide a good approximation to um, the actual distribution of the data, then perhaps I could just ask, okay, when I look at how well my model fits on the training set, is that a pretty good estimate of how well it actually fits to the population that this data comes from? So another way of phrasing that is, when I have like a low error, so my residuals are pretty low on my training set, is that also going to be the case when I use my fitted model to predict for future x's their value of y? Or is it possible that my training error is really small, but my future error is going to be enormous? And for classical methods, like least squares with a small number of covariates, maybe we're fine. The model might fit badly, but it will fit sort of equally badly on the training data and the test data because there's not much overfitting. But for a more modern method, think about a method where it's so overparametrized that when you train it, the training error is being driven down to zero. So I'm running a neural net, or I'm running something like least squares, but with an enormous number of features, anything along those lines. In that case, even this third bullet point is not achievable. So then we could ask an even weaker question. Can I at least estimate using some other mechanism what my test error will be when I try to predict y from x on future data? So my training error might be super low because of overfitting, but can I use, for example, cross-validation to tell you how well will my fitted model perform in terms of its error on future data? And as we've moved down this list, we've removed assumptions. And of course, I'm not making any of this precise, but sort of in flavor, we've removed assumptions from assuming there's a true model to assuming there's an approximate model to assuming maybe my model is terrible, but at least it's not too complex to finally saying maybe I have a model that's not even a good fit and it's hugely overparametrized. But as we get to the bottom of this list, if we still want to make any guarantees at all, like does cross-validation give you a good sense of how high your error will be in future for this fitted model. A lot of times the last assumption that's left standing, like the last one that we really cannot remove, because if we remove it, we can't even say anything for the bottom bullet point necessarily, is an assumption of algorithmic stability. And intuitively algorithmic stability basically says that when I train my algorithm, if I were to put a tiny perturbation, a tiny change to the training data, I shouldn't have large changes to the predictions coming out in my fitted model. Okay, so let's compare this to more classical types of assumptions like concentration results or consistency results. If I have a consistency result like F hat is converging at some rate to some true model or like some best model in my class, then what that would imply is that if you were to resample your entire data set, you should get approximately the same answer because a concentration result says like, with high probability, the answer you get is really close to the thing you're converging to. And if I do it twice, both answers will be really close to the thing that they're converging to. Stability is requiring something weaker. It's saying that if I were to resample not my entire training set, but just a small fraction, like maybe just one data point, that the fitted model I should get and the predictions that it makes should stay roughly the same. Not when you resample everything, but when you just resample a small fraction of the data set. So, okay, now we're going to formalize this a little bit. And I want to pause and emphasize that there's a million different definitions of algorithmic stability in the literature, and different ones are useful for different applications and in different contexts. I'm going to be just focusing on one for now. I'll change the definition slightly later, but this is just like one of many. Okay, so here's um, the definition that we'll be working with, the definition of algorithmic stability. So let me point out a few things. So first, imagine that you run your algorithm, something like least squares, on a training data set. And then imagine that you do the exact same thing, but you remove one data point from your training data set. I see there's a question. I'll get to that in just one second. And now we're going to compare the prediction on a new data point number n plus 1 that you would get had you trained on everything versus the prediction that you get if you train on everything except one training point. 
So every the training set is largely exactly the same, like out of a thousand data points, I keep 999 of them. And the question is, does that change in the prediction stay below epsilon most of the time? So like with high probability, with one minus delta probability, when your data is being drawn IID from some unknown distribution. So I don't want to assume that like the linear model is true or anything like that. So this is the definition we're working with. Okay, let me pause a second and get to these questions. Okay, so I'm just going to do these out loud as I go. Um, so the first question is, do we know F half? So when we ask about algorithmic stability, the question we're asking is not for a specific F hat that was already fitted, but like in probability, if I were to draw the data and then fit F hat, would this event hold? So that's what we're asking when we ask about stability. In practice, we do observe F hat because F hat is like the output of your neural net or the output of your run of logistic regression. So I can see F hat like when I run it on my data, but a lot of the times, theoretically, when we study it, we ask, like, with high probability, what should happen for the F hat that sort of hasn't been constructed yet. So, like, if you were to randomly draw the data and then construct F hat. So, in practice, you do see it. Okay. Um, and then second question about is about distribution shift. Um, how does distribution shift fit into this picture? That's a fantastic question. So, let me back up for a second. So, in this hierarchy of things we might want to ask, I haven't even addressed distribution shift because these questions are already challenging, even if you assume that the future test data is coming from the same distribution as the training data. If you don't assume a true model, if you don't assume that you sort of can avoid overfitting, if you don't assume stability, these questions are already challenging, even if you don't have distribution shift. So you assume that you do not have a change in distribution between training data and future data. If you also have distribution shift, then the challenge gets like many, many times harder, of course, because if we don't know anything about how the test distribution might be different from the training distribution, um, then, you know, even with, even with like the uh, something simple that doesn't have overfitting, you still might have low training error and high test error because the distribution has changed. So this framework is not addressing distribution shift at all. That would add like a whole other layer of challenge to the problem. Thanks for the questions. Okay, so for, um, for this distribution, I just want to point out a couple of things. Um, first of all, in this literature, it's really common to assume that the algorithm tra treats training data symmetrically. So for example, least squares doesn't care if you like swap the first data point and the second data point, but you keep X with Y, like you don't sort of permute which X goes with X, which Y, you just change the sort of like rows of your data table. Um, you can also think about the algorithm being randomized. For example, I'm training something with a random initialization or I'm using a random order like stochastic gradient descent. If that's the case, um, then the notation would have to change a little bit because F hat doesn't just depend on the data. It also depends on the like random seed or whatever you use to determine that randomness. Um, I'm just trying to keep the notation clean on the slides, but the framework is really easy to extend to the randomized case. So basically we should think of this as um, being universal across deterministic or randomized algorithms. Okay, before I keep going, any questions on the definition? Okay, feel free to jump in if you have questions later on. Okay, so why do we care about stability? So as I mentioned a few slides ago with our hierarchy of goals, stability is an assumption that you often need after you've removed everything else. So you don't assume a true model, you don't assume bounded complexity of like the functions you're fitting. Maybe it's over-parameterized, maybe the data is more complicated than your model class. But if you have stability, then you can still prove things along the lines of that last bullet point. Like you can still estimate how well does my fitted model perform on future data before you've seen that future data. Again, assuming that distribution drift is not an issue. So to formalize this a little bit, um, these are studied in the theory literature under different frameworks. So generalization is the framework of like, can I estimate my future test error? Learnability is asking, is it possible for the algorithm to find a function that will drive my risk? So my like, you know, error in predicting why or whatever you define as risk that will drive it down. Um, and so learn in the learnability literature, one main result is that if you can, if it's possible for an algorithm to learn on this particular data set, it's also possible to construct a stable algorithm. So basically like stability shouldn't make problems harder. Um, finally, predictive inference in the distribution free prediction literature. Um, I'll cover this in a little bit more detail in a second. Basically the idea of like, can I build a prediction interval around F hat of X that's likely to contain Y? And this goes hand in hand with generalization. 
Because how wide do I need to make that interval around my prediction? That's exactly the same as asking how big of an error am I making on my future test data? Um, however big that error is, that's how wide I need to make the interval to make it likely to contain the unseen value of y. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these in a little bit more detail. So first, let's look at generalization. So let's say that I have some loss function, for example, squared loss, that compares the actual value of y with my predicted f of x. And then what I want to do is I want to say, given my particular f, oops, sorry, given my particular fitted f hat, can I tell you what its loss will be on future data? So one way to, I'm sorry, I don't know why these are so jumpy. So one way that we can potentially do this is if the training error is zero, because I'm using like an over-parameterized method, maybe I can use cross-validation. So for example, I could use this leave one out estimate right here that says, okay, for each training data point, I'm going to retrain my model with that training point left out. And then I'm going to say, how well did I predict that ith training point? And hopefully this is a good approximation of the error that f hat will have in future. So here's a result from Bousquet and Alassif's work on stability, which says that if you have a stability condition, this condition is really similar to the stability definition that I just showed, except it's talking about how far, how different not is the prediction itself, but how different is the loss of the prediction if you train on everything versus if you train with one data point removed. So if you have this version of the stability condition, then the loss of the actual fitted function f hat is estimated well by the leave one out estimate that you can calculate on the training data. So relatedly, we can also talk about predictive inference. So predictive inference in the distribution free sense means that I want to construct a prediction interval c hat of x that's like my prediction plus or minus some margin of error, for example, is one way to do it such that with like 90% probability or whatever probability you want, it's likely to contain the value of y for your test point. And we want this to be distribution free, meaning that we want this to hold for every distribution, not like it only holds if the linear model is true or something like that. So one way to do this is to use a holdout set. Um, this is also known as the split conformal method in the distribution free literature. So basically you train on half your data, and then you look at the holdout half of your data and you say, okay, well, I can see that 90% of the time I was off by no more than like 0.7. So in future, let me use 0.7 as my margin of error for constructing prediction intervals. The problem is that when you only use half your data to train, you have a less accurate model and you end up with wider intervals. So can we instead use cross-validation or jackknife, which is another term for leave one out cross-validation in this literature, can we use it? to be able to fit on the entire training data set, not pay the price of sample splitting, but still have some sense of how wide we should make that margin of error so that predictive inference holds. So jackknife looks like this. I'm going to build my prediction interval, center it at my prediction f hat of x, plus or minus a margin of error, where this is the 1 minus alpha quantile, so let's say like the 90th percentile of my leave one out residuals. So I'm using my leave one out residuals to tell me how like like how big will my future errors likely be so that I know how wide to make this prediction interval. And what we know um, from a number of different lines in the literature is that if you don't make any assumptions at all on the algorithm, you cannot guarantee anything because the fitted model might behave totally differently when you remove one data point and calculate the leave one out residuals versus when you run it on the entire data set. So just to give a trivial example, let's say that my algorithm is this. If my sample size is even, I run a neural net. And if my sample size is odd, I run least squares. In that case, the leave one out residuals tell me nothing about how wide to make my margin of error when I center it at my prediction f hat of x. But as soon as you assume stability, then you don't need any further assumptions and predictive inference be get, becomes possible. So this is what I mean when I say that, that algorithmic stability is often the last assumption left. We've removed all assumptions about the distribution of the data. There's no assumptions about sort of the complexity of the model class or anything like that. We only need stability and then predictive inference becomes possible. Okay, um, so I have another question here. So is there any assumption on the set of possible joint distributions when we say it holds for every distribution P? That's a great question. So here, this is not a theorem, this is a goal. So distribution-free prediction has the goal of 
creating a method that will hold universally over all P rather than restricting to a certain class like all smooth distributions or something like that. Now for the methods I mentioned here, conformal prediction and split conformal, which we're not going to go into because that's outside the scope of the talk, those methods do satisfy this for every P with no assumptions at all. But once we use jackknife, which is what we want to use if we want to have a computationally feasible method, but not pay the price of data splitting and reducing the accuracy of the fitted model, now we implicitly have an assumption about P. Because when we say that the algorithm is stable, the algorithm is actually stable with respect to data drawn from P. So some algorithms might be stable with respect to data drawn from any distribution. Other algorithms might only behave in a stable way with certain data distributions, but maybe unstable with other data distributions. So hiding in the assumption of algorithmic stability is kind of implicitly a bit of an assumption about P. Um, so that's why algorithmic stability is so interesting to me, because the question is, are we really assuming nothing about the distribution? And the answer is not exactly, because algorithmic stability is actually an assumption about the interaction between the algorithm and the distribution of the data, rather than necessarily just the algorithm itself. Um, I have another question. Is stability connected with differential privacy? That is an excellent question. It is. Although it's a little bit more um, complex than I had hoped. I hope I, when I first thought about that question um, a while ago, I thought the connection would be more immediate. If you go back to um, the definition of algorithmic stability, this says that most of the time, the sensitive, sensitivity of the prediction is bounded by epsilon. For differential privacy, you generally have a starting point that you have a function where if you remove one data point, the sensitivity has to be always bounded by epsilon or like nearly always, like you would need delta to be like exponentially small in the sample size or something like that. So this type of sensitivity bound to the function is not actually enough for building differential privacy on top of it by adding noise, but it's very closely related. So that's a really good insight. Okay. So, all right. So this has shown us sort of why we care about algorithmic stability. So let's now ask, like, should we just sort of proceed happily and say, great, as long as you have algorithmic stability, you have all these nice downstream statistical results, um, or is that not quite enough? So at a high level, like, what do we want when we try to do robust statistics, non-parametric statistics, distribution-free statistics? We want methods that are valid more universally than methods that are like super heavily reliant on modeling assumptions. And in particular, I would argue that the problem isn't making assumptions, because if I make an assumption, I could maybe check if it holds. The problem is making assumptions that are untestable. If I have an assumption which I like theoretically establish, it's impossible to verify that this assumption holds by just observing data, then I have to take it on faith. I'm not able to verify that what I'm doing is actually valid for this data set. So certain assumptions about the distribution are themselves untestable. So smoothness, for example, is an untestable assumption. If you have a, um, a test that checks whether the distribution is smooth, so for example, like the, the mean of y given x is a smooth function of x or something like that. If you have a test that verifies that that's smooth, that test itself will only be valid if you assume additional untestable conditions. So in other words, we want to avoid these assumptions on P unless we're in a situation where we're super, super confident that they hold, because if we're not confident that they hold, they're impossible to test. So instead, maybe we turn to some robust methods. So like instead of running least squares and using the parametric formula for how wide to make my prediction interval, maybe let me use cross-validation and jackknife to tell me how wide to make my interval. But that construction, doesn't assume that the model is true anymore, so that's good, but it instead the assumes the algorithm is stable. And so the question is, have we taken one untestable assumption and removed it at the cost of adding a different untestable assumption? So is algorithmic stability something we can test, or is it untestable, in which case I'm like still stuck? I still have the problem where I'm, you know, counting on the assumption to be true, but I cannot know that it failed and that my assumption, that my, um, statistical method is actually invalid. Okay, so should we worry about algorithms being unstable? So some algorithms are stable just by construction. So here are a few examples. Nearest neighbors is stable. That's because if I remove a training point at random, probably I did not remove one of the nearest neighbors of the point where I'm about to make a prediction because I removed it at random. And so that's stable for any distribution of data. 
Another example is ridge regression or more generally anything where you have a strongly convex penalty on an optimization problem. If you make a few more assumptions about the functions that you're optimizing over, the strongly convex penalty means that if you slightly perturb the data set, you're guaranteed to only slightly perturb the solution. And as a result, your predictions don't jump around too much when you remove just one data set. Sorry, just one data point. Now, let me show some evidence in the other direction that we should worry about algorithms being stable. So I'm gonna start with the simplest algorithm we all know and love, which is just least squares. And what I'm plotting here is along the horizontal axis, my prediction for a new test point, along the vertical axis, my prediction for the same test point when I remove one training point at random. So in the left-hand plot, the dimension is 100 and the sample size is 500. So I have a reasonably large sample size for this dimension D. And you can see that the points cluster along the diagonal line. So um, I have pretty good stability. The prediction doesn't change too much because the diagonal line is where the prediction stays exactly the same. In the right-hand plot, the sample size is lower. This is like almost an over-parameterized problem. And here you can see that the points are way off the diagonal line. And as a result, we have huge instability. The predictions are jumping around a lot. And again, this is for the simplest algorithm we know. This is for least squares. So if least squares can already be unstable, maybe we should be worried that other things can be unstable too. Now, least squares itself is not the problem because for least squares, we can theoretically quantify its instability. I'm only using this as evidence that instability does happen in the wild with algorithms that we use. Okay, so exhibit B. In my view, modern machine learning methods are A, too complex, and B, developing and changing too quickly for us to hope to be able to theoretically understand their stability properties. So generally, there's a lot of really quickly developing theory for understanding like what happens with neural networks, why do they work, what function classes are they approximating, and so on. But a lot of that theory is um, often making simplifying assumptions. So it's sort of like, you know, depth two or taking other sorts of approximations to the problem. And also, um, of course, is going to take time to develop. So like whatever is the most cutting edge state of the art version of the methodology, probably we don't have theory for it yet. And so for modern machine learning methods, whatever is the state of the art, we probably don't know theoretically whether it's stable. So that's just an unknown. And then finally, just something that I thought was kind of curious, when I poked around in some R packages, one thing you can find is that they have like helpful default settings that make things perform more reliably. And one of the side effects of that is that there's a lot of these if then flags that say like, if the sample size is below a certain threshold, set the parameters like this. And if it's above that threshold, set the parameters some other way. And one thing that that does is it kind of calls into question, like when I had a silly example, let's imagine if your sample size is even, you do this. And if it's odd, you do that. Well, maybe that's not so silly because actually we don't necessarily know what's hiding inside the code of the packages we use. And there might be these things that say like, if the sample size crosses a certain threshold, then change some sort of underlying setting of the algorithm. So I don't know whether this will empirically create instability, but it certainly gives us, gives us reason to pause and think about ways in which instability can arise. But I want to emphasize that you do not have to have this kind of like if then thing hiding in your code to have instability. Two slides ago, we saw that least squares with no settings being changed because it like has no settings. It's just least squares. Least squares is already highly unstable in certain regimes. So instability definitely is something that can occur easily in practice. Okay, so that's my overview of the setting and sort of why algorithmic stability is important for us to consider, why it's a useful assumption, but also why we might worry whether it's a testable assumption and whether it's a frequently satisfied assumption. So let me pause here for a second and see if there's any questions before we jump into part one. Oh, great question. Okay, so this question is asking, Do when we say something is stable, do we mean that the parameters epsilon and delta defining stability, let me scroll back, do we mean these parameters go to zero? Um, because of course, everything is stable if you make epsilon and or delta large enough. So yeah, that's a great point. So I'm actually thinking about a finite end setting. So we don't necessarily need to think of things going to zero. What I really mean is, um, stability is not a yes or no question, although, of course, this definition makes it sound like one. It either holds or doesn't hold. Well, I'm really thinking is, at what epsilon and delta is this true for my algorithm for my fixed finite n? And at what epsilon and delta is this false? 
So if it's true for epsilon and delta that are quite small, then we get useful results that say like predictive inference holds with sort of like only small errors. And if this is false, unless I make epsilon and delta enormous, then um, if I were to say like how well does, um, for example, how well does the leave one out error predict my future risk, the error becomes larger. So it's more of a continuum. It's not really, is it stable, yes or no? It's more how stable is it? So for example, here in this generalization result where we say like my future test error is predicted well by the leave one out estimate, the stability um, parameter appears in that error in estimation of the risk. Um, if we were to think about n going to infinity, then yes, it would be useful to ask, is it stable in the sense of like epsilon and delta going to zero? But we're actually studying the finite n question. And part of the reason I'm interested in that is because when we talk about untestable assumptions here, um, if I had something that verified that things are fine as n goes to infinity, I still don't know whether for my particular data set, I'm already in asymptopia and things are like working pretty well, or things are working terribly, but like if n were 100 times bigger, then they'd be working really well, right? So if like, have I hit my asymptotics sort of, you know, roughly speaking, if like that's also something that's untestable, then the asymptotic result is not useful to me in practice for knowing whether like my prediction interval is going to be reliable or not. So that's why we, um, for this field, um, often prefer to phrase these questions in the finite sample sense. But of course, to try to characterize the problem, it's also useful to think about what happens as m gets larger. And we'll see some results along those lines along the way as well. Okay, other questions? All right, let's jump into part one. So again, part one, um, which is joint with my uh, former PhD advisee, Buell Kim, um, part one is a hardness result that tells us, um, basically, we don't want untestable assumptions, but unfortunately, it's hard to test algorithmic stability. So let's define the setting. So this is what we call the black box setting. We're going to learn how the algorithm works by running it on data. So for example, I have my code, and I can like push a button and deploy that code to fit my F hat as many times as I like. Let's say we don't even have a computational budget. I can run it on real data, I can run it on simulated data, I can do it over and over again. But what I cannot do is I cannot theoretically analyze the algorithm. And the reason that we say this is because, you know, some algorithms are too complex for me to hope to get a theoretical result about. So the easiest way to formalize that is to say, like, I, I'm not even going to be able to read the code that defines A. All I have access to is like the button you push that runs A finitely many times, but as many times as you like but I cannot run it like uncountably infinitely many times or anything like that. So for example, I can't say like, what would be the worst perturbation you could get for any data point you could plug in? Because any data point you could plug in means I have to run it in infinitely many times. Um, there's a question about whether we could extend this to algorithms for functional data. Um, that is a great question. Um, we don't really, so the general formulation of this, um, even though most of our paper is written with like X in R to the D and Y in R, the general formulation, which we do comment on in the paper, so I'll just point you to that if you're more interested, um, is really just saying that X and Y can live in any space, um, but these hardness results um, come from the uncountability of that space. Um, you can also give yourself a countable, uh, a finite computational budget, and then the hardness results just come from like having a large size of the space. So Y is not like a binary label. Um, so for functional data, I think you could get similar results by just letting the data live in a different space. Okay, so what do we want? We want to test that when you give it some amount of available data, and when you give it the button to push to run the algorithm A, so it can't read the code for the algorithm, but it can call the algorithm, it's going to return a one or a zero. One means I'm confident that this algorithm is stable with respect to this data set for a particular sample size that you specified at a particular level, epsilon and delta that you specified. And zero means I don't know, like maybe it's unstable or maybe I'm just not sure if it's stable. And we want it to be valid, meaning that we want to control sort of the equivalent of type one error. Like if we um, return a one and we're saying that we're confident it's stable, we want that to be reliable. So for any algorithm that's actually not stable at this epsilon and delta, I'd like to have at most like, you know, alpha or 10%, 5%, whatever you choose, probability of falsely declaring it to be stable. Now, of course, I can do that trivially. I can just always return zero, or I can like flip a coin and return one only 10% of the time, but that's not useful. I also want power. 
So we also want to, to show that there are some stable algorithms which are so clearly stable that they have a high probability of being correctly certified as stable. So that we should think of this as like a certificate. It's only useful if it has low false positives. So that's the first criterion, but at least for easy problems, high true positives. So that's the second criterion. So this is what we wanna do. Okay, so formally, we're gonna define it as a black box test as follows. Again, basically all we're doing is formalizing the idea that you can call A, but you cannot read the code that defines A. So we're gonna do this iteratively. So first I'm gonna read in my data and then I'm gonna generate a data set and call A on that data set. So for example, you give me data and I will bootstrap a new sample from that data set and fit my model on that new sample and use it to predict on my bootstrap test samples or something like that. And then you can do that again. So based on what I saw, maybe what I saw is that small values of X tend to have a more unstable behavior. So let me now bootstrap specifically focusing on small values of X, for example, and do the whole thing again. And now I'm just gonna keep doing that however many times I like. I can keep resampling the real data. Maybe what I do at some point is I fit a model to the real data and I generate new data from that model. And at the end of the day, my output, my zero or one, is just a function of all of the steps of this iterative procedure where I called A as many times as I wanted. So that's our definition of a black box test, which basically says you can study A empirically, but you cannot analyze A theoretically. Okay, so now let's have a baseline. So what is like a test that definitely works? Maybe it's not gonna be the best test. We're actually gonna see it's very naive. So first, let me construct batches of my data. So for example, let's say you ask me, is this algorithm stable for training at size 100, but you give me 200 or more data points to work with from the unknown distribution, from the population. That means that I can construct two independent batches of training data and independently two times run the procedure of like training on a sample of size 100 and seeing what happens. So that's what we're gonna do. So for each independent batch of data, we're going to train on the case batch right here. We're going to train again on the case batch with one data point removed at random. The data points are IID, so like I remove the last one, that's the same as removing one at random. I'm going to see how much my prediction changes, and then I'm just gonna check is that prediction above or below epsilon. If it's usually below epsilon, maybe I can return a one. I think it's stable. If it's frequently enough above epsilon, I'm going to have to return a zero and say this algorithm is potentially unstable. And to decide how many times is too many times, I'm just going to compare the number of times my perturbation is above epsilon against the binomial distribution because these are independent batches. So all I'm asking is when I flipped this coin, however many times, like however many batches you have, is its probability of coming up positive, like yes, this perturbation was larger than epsilon, is that probability definitely below delta or is it potentially higher than delta, in which case maybe I fail to have stability. So this is our naive test. So how does it perform? So first of all, because the batches are independent, comparing to the binomial distribution is always valid, so the validity is there. Now the power is going to be really low, and that's because I use the data super inefficiently. Like you give me 200 independent data points, I turn that into just two flips of a coin. Like how much could you possibly learn from two flips of a coin? And this power is really low. Basically, if the number of batches you have kappa is small, then the power can only be a little bit higher than alpha. So it's only gonna be like a little bit better than random. So this is not surprising. It makes really inefficient use of the data. So it's valid, but probably we can do better by using the data more efficiently. Like maybe let me shuffle the data and resample and do this many times. We would expect that we would learn more and improve the power of this procedure. So here's the surprising hardness result. The result is that actually the power that the binomial test achieves for certain alphas and deltas is actually the optimal power. So any test that is universally valid meaning its error of falsely declaring stability is bounded by alpha universally across all algorithms and all distribution. If a test satisfies that universal validity, then for every algorithm you give it, even if it's the easiest, simplest, most stable algorithm, for every algorithm you give it, the power that this test can have to certify the algorithm is stable is upper bounded by the same power that the binomial test achieves again, for certain values of alpha and delta. So for small alpha and delta, these are equal to each other. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that 
every black box test, if it's valid, it has low power. And when I say low power, I don't mean there are some stable algorithms that it has low power for. This result says it has low power for every stable, stable algorithm. In other words, any stable algorithm is undetectable because it's actually turned out to be super close to an unstable algorithm, so close that a test that makes no assumptions cannot tell them apart. And this basically tells us that there's no information you can gain from calling A more times, from like calling A on bootstrap data, on simulated data, on um, resample data. And why is that? So the reason this sounds so weird to us is because we believe when we construct data that's similar to the true data, we should be able to observe answers that are informative about how A behaves on the true data. But when we say that belief, we're implicitly assuming that A has some kind of continuity in its behavior, that when I feed it similar data, I get similar behavior. If that's not true, if A is arbitrarily discontinuous, so I make no assumptions on my algorithm, it's not smooth in any way, then when I feed it similar data, I learn nothing because it might behave in a completely different way on the bootstrap data than on the real data, even though bootstrap data is quite similar to real data. So that's where this impossibility result is coming from. Okay, um, I know I'm running a little low on time. So let me just give a like one second summary of the proof sketch. The idea basically is that for any stable algorithm, we're going to construct an unstable algorithm and a distribution P prime that's a perturbation of the original distribution P so that these two scenarios, AP, which is stable, and A prime, P prime, which is not stable, are indistinguishable, except if you make assumptions to make the second version impossible. Like if you say, no, no, like all algorithms have to be smooth, then that would sort of rule out A prime, P prime. But if you're assumption free, we can construct something that's unstable, that's arbitrarily close to anything that's stable. And that means that any valid test is going to be unable to distinguish them. It's going to have to return a zero as like the safe answer. So that's the main idea. Okay, I will skip the detail. All right, so to summarize, our results for this part show that the binomial test is super inefficient, but at the same time is optimal. And that is because we're not making any assumptions on like smoothness of the distribution, behavior of the algorithm, or anything like that. And what this raises is questions like, why is it that this is sort of not something we necessarily worry about in practice. In practice, we believe that we can observe whether the algorithm behaves in a stable way or not. And that must mean that implicitly we're making some kind of assumptions in the back of our mind when we empirically try to test for stability. We're assuming some kind of nicer properties of behavior than the like worst case scenario that constructs the counterexample in the proof. So perhaps we're assuming some kind of continuous behavior of A, feed it similar data, get similar behavior in the output, Perhaps instead we should think of this as changing the definition of stability, that this hardness result says that this definition of stability is untestable, but maybe when we actually ask about stability in practice, maybe we mean something a little bit different. And finally, if none of those things work, maybe we can instead ask, what can we do to create guardrails around any algorithm and say that if you give me something and I cannot test if it's stable or unstable, can I add like a pre or post processing step? that's going to guarantee stability because I cannot test stability. So I need some other mechanism to know that stability is a property that this algorithm has. So that leads us into part two. In part two, we're gonna ask the question, is there a way to convert any algorithm into a stable algorithm? So I'd like to use my state-of-the-art procedure. It's too complex for me to analyze it theoretically. This black box hardness result says I cannot assume stability. What do I do? So in this part, so this is joint with Jake Soloff and Rebecca Willett. In this part, we said, okay, well, what do people do empirically? Empirically, people often use bagging or ensembling. They run the algorithm many times on different versions of the training set, and then they somehow average or combine the outputs. And empirically, this is known to be more stable as well as often more accurate, lower variance, and lots of other good things. So formally, what we mean by bagging is that we're going to draw lots of subsets of my training data. We're going to run the algorithm on each one of my subsets, and then we're going to aggregate those outputs. So in this work, we studied aggregation by just taking the mean. Obviously, this doesn't really make sense for a classification problem. Like if the algorithm sometimes labels the image as a cat and sometimes a dog, you can't really average that. But in a regression problem where the output is real valued, you can take the mean. So this is the setting that we're studying in this particular work. Okay. 
So what does bagging look like in practice? So the most common variants are um, what we are referring to as classical bagging. So usually people just say bagging. You sample with replacement from your training data. And if the number of times you sample M is taken to be equal to the sample size N, this is often called bootstrapping. So I sample N times from N things with replacement. You can also use what's known as sub-bagging, where you sample without replacement. In this case, it's common to su subsample, like for example, half of the training data. There might be other settings where you want to reduce the training set size and subsample massively. Like I have a training set that's too big, it's like 10 million. And I subsample batches of size 10,000 so that I can actually run my algorithm many, many times and I can afford that computationally. Okay, so bagging is everywhere in the statistics literature. It's been used for decades. Um, it's really well known as a step in random forest. So you construct your regression or classification tree and then you aggregate them together to a random forest. It also appears in the stability selection method for variable selection and regression. It's used for lots of other things, including in Bayesian statistics and many, many more. So I won't go in, I don't have time to go into any details, but basically bagging is sort of universally used and loved and it gives lots of great theoretical answers and empirical properties, but empirically, it's um, empirically stability is one of the things that it's known for, and so that's what we're really interested in understanding theoretically. So theoretically, the properties are, that are known are that it it creates a more smooth output, it reduces variance, it um, creates robustness. But whether it guarantees stability is something that primarily was studied for like more specific um, regimes rather than more universally. Um, in particular, it was studied for the regime where the bag size M is much smaller than the total sample size N. But in practice, it's really common for these to be proportional, like for example, for bootstrapping where they're equal. So that's a regime that we were very interested in understanding because empirically, stability is created by bagging even when M is large, when M equals N. Okay, so here's a little bit of empirical evidence to show us that across lots of different base algorithms, you have this phenomenon where you might start with something really unstable, and then you end up with something really stable after you apply bagging. So here we have logistic regression, a neural network, and regression trees. All of these have been bagged to create averaged output for regression trees. This is like a random forest. Um, and for all of these, what we see is in red, this is how much the prediction can move over when you remove one data point at random. So it can be pretty high. We're on a scale of zero to one for the predictions. So for example, at the top for logistic regression, you can see the prediction can jump by as much as like 0.2 or 0.25. So that's actually a really big perturbation. By the time you apply bagging, the perturbations that you get, like how much does your prediction change when you remove one data point, um, that is a lot smaller. So the blue histograms are concentrated much closer to zero. So we're seeing empirically some evidence that you can start with something unstable, apply bagging to any algorithm you want to use, and end up with something that's much more stable. So the reason this is nice is basically, at least empirically for now, what we see is that if you want stability, that doesn't mean throw out your neural network and instead use nearest neighbors. We could do that, it would give us stability, but we would lose whatever state of the art performance is like motivating us to want to use neural nets. Um, instead, this says use whatever algorithm you like, but if you combine it with bagging, then you will see that you get stability. So this is the phenomenon that we're studying. Okay, now let's take a look again and revisit the definition of stability. So again, to remind ourselves, in the first part of the talk, the definition of stability is actually a definition not about A itself, but about how A um, behaves with respect to data from some distribution P. In this part, we're actually going to talk about a deterministic version of stability that says an algorithm is stable if deterministically for any training data set and any test point X where you want to predict, if you drop one training point at random, so, oops, sorry, that's why we're averaging over all I. So you remove one training point chosen at random from I equals one to N, then most of the time you will not move by more than epsilon. So at most delta of the time, so at most delta fraction of the training points, are influential enough that when you remove them, your prediction jumps by epsilon. So this is a strictly stronger definition. If this definition holds deterministically for any data set, then the part one definition also holds because that is only required to hold for a data set drawn from a particular distribution. And what we'll see is that even with this stronger definition of stability, it's possible to show that bagging satisfies this automatically 
no matter what the data set is, no matter what algorithm you are using it um, on top of. So bagging on top of logistic regression or any other algorithm. So here's our main result. So I want to point out the role of a parameter P. So P is how likely is any given data point to appear in any given bag? So for example, for bootstrapping, um, appearing in a bag versus not appearing in a bag, those um, occur with approximately probabilities one over E and one minus one over E. So this is a constant bounded away from zero, bounded away from one. You could also consider P going to zero and P going to one. I'll return to that in a second. Okay, so here's our result, and I'm stating it in a simplified um, setting. Let's assume that your algorithm always returns predictions that are valued in the 0, 1 interval, and let's also take the number of bags to infinity. Then any bagged algorithm, so the bagged version of any base algorithm, satisfies stability at a level epsilon and delta as long as delta times epsilon squared is um, at least basically 1 over n, we should think of this as. So what this is saying is that for a large sample size, you satisfy stability for a very small delta and epsilon, or alternatively, you can think of this as as n goes to infinity, this is like the rate at which your delta and epsilon for which stability is satisfied, the rate at which those go to are guaranteed to go to zero for any algorithm. Of course, it could be that it's more stable than this, that even for a smaller delta and epsilon, stability holds. But this is the guarantee for any algorithm A, no matter how unstable it was before. So we'll see this empirically in a second. Just to point out a couple of ways in which we can extend this result, and we look at this in our paper. First of all, like before, right now, just for simplicity, I'm writing A as a deterministic algorithm, but we can think of it as randomized. Here, just so that the bound looks clean, I've taken B to infinity. If you have a finite B, like in practice, of course, you have a finite number of bags. Um, the the right-hand side here just looks a little bit more complicated. Basically, as soon as the number of bags is fairly large, like order n, um, you don't really lose anything by having a finite b. And finally, if you want your predictions to lie in an unbounded space, we do have extensions to that, but things get substantially more messy where basically the scale of your stability of your epsilon perturbation has to kind of look at the scale of the outputs of the data predictions. And so it gets a little bit more complex, and I'm going to skip that here. Okay, so let's step back and take a look at what this means for different sampling regimes. So this is basically having to do with the parameter P, which for like standard subbagging, like for example, M equals N over two. So each bag has half of the data sampled without replacement. P is just a constant between zero and one. So that's the proportional sampling regime. But we might also be interested in other regimes. So in the middle bullet point, we have massive subsampling. So again, if n is like 10 million, maybe I can't afford to computationally like train my algorithm repeatedly on data sets that are order n in size. So maybe I do massive subsampling where m is a vanishing fraction of my total data set. And I just do that many, many, many times and I average. So in that case, because of the massive subsampling, the stability result is even better. Delta and epsilon go down to zero faster. Now, an interesting regime is actually the other way. Is it possible to get stability if m is nearly as large as n? So instead of p going to 0, p goes to 1. And it turns out that, yes, you can take something like, for example, let's say you do subbagging, so I sample without replacement. I'm going to just randomly remove square root n, many data points, out of my sample of size n. And then I also get stability, just at a slower rate for how delta and epsilon go to 0. And the reason this last regime is interesting is because of the opposite setting. Instead of n is 10 million, think of n as being in the hundreds. If n is in the hundreds, I don't necessarily want to cut it in half before training my models because I don't want to lose accuracy in that way. Minimal subsampling tells us that you can remove a small fraction of your data set and do that many, many times on average, and that's already enough to induce stability. Okay. Um, so proof sketch, I'm just going to mostly skip over this, but basically the idea is that it's a counting argument. If you um, want to say that this holds for a randomly removed data point, all we have to say is that the number of training points that can be influential enough to create an epsilon perturbation in the prediction, that has to be bounded. So this is a counting argument that basically says that, you know, for example, let's say that when I remove data point I, the prediction massively goes down. That would have to mean that um, the bags that contain I that got removed 
are all predicting larger than average values of y. It's not possible for everyone to be larger than average. So that can only be true for like a limited number of data points i. So that type of counting argument is where this result comes from. OK, let's see some empirical results. So I'm going to show you the three same algorithms we looked at a plot of a minute ago, neural nets, regression trees, logistic regression. In each of these, one line here, the red line, shows how stable it was before bagging. And this red line is high up in the plot, meaning that it's only stable for large-ish values of epsilon and delta. Once we bag, this navy blue line is much lower, meaning now it's stable for smaller values of epsilon and delta. The black dotted line is the theoretical guarantee, which guarantees that after bagging, the stability has to be at least as good as the dotted line, meaning it has to lie below the dotted line. And we can see that the navy blue curve does lie below the line. So something that was unstable became more stable. Same kind of picture for regression trees. Here you have even more instability until you bag, and then you are much more stable. Now here's an interesting one for logistic regression. For logistic regression, kind of like for least squares, instability happens at a certain ratio between dimensionality and sample size. And it turns out that here, where the data is actually pure noise, so like the, um, the class 0 and 1 is unrelated to x, the transition is around d equals n over 2. That's where um, you, uh, that's the phase transition to get perfect separation between the positive and negative labels with some um, linear separator. So at that point, the maximum likelihood estimate doesn't even exist, and your solution runs off to infinity and things get really unstable. So what we can see for the solid line, where d is much smaller than n over 2, the solid red line before bagging is already very stable. On the other hand, for the dashed red line, where d is equal to n over 2, it's highly unstable. It's really high up in the plot. But after bagging, for both versions, whether it was unstable or stable initially, it ends up being stable after you apply that. OK, um, our last theoretical result here tells us that this 1 over n scaling that we get for saying like how stable is everything after bagging, whether it's logistic regression or neural nets or anything else, that 1 over n is optimal. What we can show is that for any smaller scaling of epsilon and delta, we can construct a counterexample, which is a base algorithm A whose bagged version is not stable at that epsilon and delta. So in other words, this scaling of how much stability is guaranteed to hold after bagging is the best result you can get if you're not willing to place any assumptions on the algorithm A and you want something that holds universally over all base algorithms A. Um, here's a picture of the upper and lower bound compared with each other. So the blue region is higher values of epsilon and delta. And those are the values at which stability is guaranteed to hold for any base algorithm A. The red region is the region within which we have a counterexample. So for those lower, more stable epsilons and deltas, we can construct an algorithm whose bagged version does not satisfy stability down in that sort of more stable, lower region of the plot. And the white gap in between is basically the unknown. So that's like the gap in the constants between our upper and lower bounds. OK, um, so I'll skip the proof sketch for that. And finally, I just want to mention, and this actually kind of circles back to the question that was asked about differential privacy. I just want to mention the difference between removing a training point at random versus saying that every training point, if you were to remove it, cannot perturb the output by more than epsilon. If you had this much stronger requirement for what it means to be stable, this would actually be a sensitivity bound on the function in the sense that's used for differential privacy. With this stronger assumption, you could then add noise to your output and get privacy. But this stronger assumption is much harder to achieve. So something like this doesn't even allow for nearest neighbors, because if I remove the data point i that is one of the nearest neighbors, um, unless epsilon is large enough, perhaps my prediction does jump by more than epsilon. Um, and it, another result is that bagging doesn't actually guarantee this to hold, um, except at like a much worse epsilon. So basically, if you take epsilon to equal p, p being again, how often is any data point in any bag? So if I do um, sub bagging with half the data in every bag, p is a half. So then you can guarantee that bagged algorithms are stable with epsilon equal to p, but are not necessarily stable for any epsilon smaller than p. So if you're doing minimal, um, sorry, if you're doing massive subsampling, like you might do when n is 10 million, 
Sure, you already have this version of stability because P is really small. But if you're doing proportional sampling, where P is a constant between zero and one, this version of stability is not guaranteed by bagging. You would need a much, much heavier assumption on the original algorithm to get something like this. So that's why we work with average case stability. And what's interesting is that the average case stability, as we saw in the introduction to this talk, is already enough for you to get generalization, for you to get distribution free validity for predictive inference, and lots of downstream statistical implications, although perhaps not privacy. So understanding the sort of differences and pros and cons of these different definitions is also like a really interesting aspect um, of this field. Okay, so to wrap up, what we've seen is that bagging, whether it's classical bagging or sub bagging or other variants we can consider as well, you can apply it to any algorithm A, no matter how complex it was, no matter how unstable it was, and you automatically get a stability guarantee for the bagged version of this algorithm. As a result, generalization results, um, predictive inference results, and so on will all hold if you combine them with bagged versions of any base algorithm that you choose to use. Of course, there's tons of open questions here. So first of all, um, as I mentioned a minute ago, the choice of definition of stability matters a lot. There's a million definitions out there. There's probably more that um, we may ne not necessarily have studied yet. How, this, how these different results all interact with exactly how we define stability is a really interesting question. Now, we've only studied averaging, which only makes sense when the output is like some real valued regression type thing. Um, asking what would happen for prediction problems where the output is not real valued or where you want to aggregate in a different way is also a really important question because that's another way in which bagging is used in practice. So theoretically, we'd like to understand that as well. Okay, so with that, let me wrap up and thank everyone for the great questions so far and looking forward to more questions and feedback from everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rina. Um, let me stop recording and let's move to the discussion.